I'd like to uh, to turn it over to Nick in uh, in one second, and uh, uh, I'm really grateful to Nick for uh, for volunteering his time to us. Uh, we've done one other seminar with him or webinar with him a month ago, and uh, I see a lot of people that were in that webinar have come back today. So uh, that speaks to uh, the quality of, of work that Nick does. Uh, Nick has been working full time as an international consultant and conflict resolution practitioner since 1989. Uh, he co-founded Policy Management Consulting Group at that time, which is a full-service consulting, facilitation, and conflict management organization. As a professional consultant, presenter, and facilitator since 1986, Nick has been busy, uh, uh, has had a busy practice, which practically and realistically has assisted over 20,000 employees from public and private sector, uh, North American organizations, on many things such as operations management, conflict resolution, mediation, emotional intelligence, and negotiation. He comes to us with senior positions in industrial engineering, manufacturing, logistics, and HR, and has extensive uh, leadership and management experience in operations. Uh, so Nick lives here in Niagara, and he's the president of Policy Management Consulting Group. He's authored and co-authored several articles and uh, his expertise in operations management, human behavior, strategic facilitation, and conflict resolution. And uh, with that in mind, I'd really like to turn it over to, uh, to Nick Policy um, to hear about negotiations, which is something that is so important to, uh, to, to all of us, uh, uh, but especially those of us uh, running a business. So without further ado, Nick, uh, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, I'm sure there's a couple things I left out about the company itself or, and, and about you, but thank you for doing this. Oh, thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, uh, thank you to you, Rob and Adrian, as well as the people who have joined us today. I uh, just want to capitalize, give you a, a brief 20 second overview, a little bit about the company. Rob summed it up very well. We're, we're a consulting company that's been in business since 1989, and our primary focus is to basically provide customized training, strategic facilitation, coaching, coaching counseling, conflict resolution, and mediation services in a swift and professional manner so our clients can get on with their business. We have clients in North America, Millicron, Millicron uh, Continental Tire and Rubber, Feral Chocolates, Cadbury Tree Bar Elm, the Canadian Management Center, the Supreme Court of Canada, Stackpole Automotive Gear Division, Hammond Power Solutions, just to name a few. So uh, we're, we're talking today a little bit about, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I've already got that screwed up. We're, uh, we're talking a little bit about practical solutions to uh, brass tax negotiation. And since we're talking practical solutions, I want to be the totally practical facilitator. So we have a 35 to 40 minute uh, presentation. We take questions, answers, comments, concerns, anytime you can unmute your button and ask your question or you can uh, type in on the chat chat line. At the end, we're going to leave 15 or 20 minutes for uh, questions, answers, comments, concerns. And if that's not ample, we're going to leave an extra 10 or 15 minutes if you want to stay on the call. And, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll address any issues that you have. So uh, what are we going to discuss today? Well, uh, some of the session goals. We're going, to, we're going to look at the five basics associated with negotiation. I won't get into the six-step model that I've developed because I, I can't cover it all in that period of time, but we're going to define what negotiation is or at least give you a definition that you can use in terms of what you think negotiation might be, and you can massage that back and forth. We're going to look at the foundation and the principles associated with negotiation, as well as the approaches to negotiation, the do's and don'ts, as well as traps. I call them the traps, the irritants, the truisms, some of the sins that we commit during negotiation, as well as familiarize ourselves with negotiating, with negotiating tactics. So uh, let's talk a little bit about right off the hop as to what negotiation is. To me, negotiation is a process of communicating back and forth for the purposes of reaching a joint agreement about differing needs. And notice through that definition, what's applied, it's an exercise in influence where negotiations is a function of moving people through a process which can lead to a joint workable agreement. And basically, that's what we're trying to do. Get an agreement that we can both live with. 
And if we, we buy into the definition, then we'll look at the objectives. It's really about shaping the perception of the other party, trying to influence the strategy associated with coming up to a joint workable solution and getting the best final offer from the other party. What we wanna do is we wanna maximize our leverage in order to optimize the result. You may not always get the, the offer that you want. It becomes a question of what can I live with? What is, what is the best alternative for me? And the foundation of negotiation is this. In order to get what you want, you have to give the other side what they need. Now, you can reverse that. In order to get what they want, you have to give them what, they, uh, what you need. You can, you can leverage this either way, but it really comes down to three very important principles. Principle number one, can the other party trust you? Number two, do you care about them and their needs, and are you committed? Let's look at that very closely. Can I trust you to make a decision and work towards a joint workable agreement that is satisfactory to both companies? Do you care about me? Do you care about my needs? Do you care about what I have to bring back to my people? Do you care about the overall joint solution and the effectiveness of that solution? And last but not least, are you committed to making it work? Now, the other party may not come right out and say that, but those are the three principles that they're looking at in a negotiation process. And I tell this to people all the time, the solution may not be as important as the rapport that you have with the other party. You need to have a rapport with the other party because they'll be willing to work with you moving forward. In an article that was written not that long ago by a gentleman by the name of Hal Gregerson. Hal Gregerson is a good friend of mine and he's the executive director uh, for the uh, Leadership Center at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he said that negotiation for most people is very uncomfortable because not everybody leads in precisely the exact way or negotiates in the exact way and the uncertainty underscores the negotiating process. But three things come back to uh, uh, as the foundation. That's trust, that's care, and that's commitment. And these underlying principles underscore what Gregerson's talking about. Now, let's look at approaches to negotiation. There's two very different approaches. One's called the distributive approach. This is a competition over who gets what. It's a win-lose situation. The pie is only so big, there are eight slices to that pie, and I need to get a minimum of four, but I'd like to have six. Well, if you're getting six, that leaves the other party with only two. It leads to a win-lose situation, and the other party now learns A, not to trust, B, not to care, and C, there's no commitment. So we see that a lot now with organizations as they negotiate new contracts with suppliers or vendors, they have a tendency sometimes to grind them down. Well, that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for error on the other party side. And sometimes they're forced into those negotiations or forced to take that agreement, but they won't take it for long. They're only gonna be there for a short period of time because it's a win-lose situation. The other piece is the best one the integrative piece. It's a collaborative assumption. It's, a, it, it's the issue or the prize, if you will, is much bigger than what you make. The pie's not eight slices, it's whatever we need it to be. It is an integrative approach where both parties collaborate and share information in order to create a win-win situation. And that's what we want, that's what this presentation is supposed to be about. It concentrates on that integrative, um, integrative solution. What can you negotiate? Let's look at what you can negotiate. And I, I hear people always say, um, you know, we're only here to negotiate one thing. I say baloney. I'm gonna go back to my old professor at Brock University when I was doing my business degree there, a fellow by the name of Dr. James Whitehead. He taught me negotiation, management 467, 468, one of the most important courses I ever took. Anything is negotiable. 
except death. Everything's on the table until it's off the table. You can negotiate things like pricing. You can negotiate things like terms of remuneration, delivery, quality, quantity, service agreements, training agreements, resources, scope of involvement, processes, just to name a few, just to name a few. Depending on what you're negotiating, you may have a ton more, but these are the five, these are the nine basic things that over my career that's expanded over 30 years that I find what you can negotiate. And you can negotiate any of them at, at, in, in the process. Don't be afraid to ask. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about negotiation traps. Now that we've said that, and if I'm going too fast, please let Rob know. I know I've only got 35 minutes, but this is a topic that's very near and dear to me. And I, I, I like to give you as much information as I can. The traps that people fall into, too. Single, single issue negotiation and sequence negotiation. Stay away from them. Single issue negotiation is this. We're here to negotiate price and price only. That leaves no room for any type of flexibility. Price is predicated to terms. Price is predicated to quality. Price is predicated to quantity. Price is uh, uh, predicated to uh, uh, financial terms, when people are going to pay. Stay away from single issue negotiations because it backs the other party into a corner. And when people don't get angry, they just get even. And single negotiation is the foundation for that. And secondly, stay away from sequence negotiation, where somebody says, well, we can't discuss price until we discuss terms. We can't discuss terms until we discuss quality. We can't discuss quality until we discuss something else. Baloney. You can discuss one, jump to issue 10, go back to three, talk about issue seven, go to six, go to nine. Everything's negotiable. Everything is on the table. That's the only way you have an integrative approach to negotiation. You can couple things together. Stay away from those traps. They aren't good. They'll back you into a corner all the time. And what's going to wind up happening, you're going to wind up leaving value on the table. And talking about leaving value on the table, let's talk about negotiating sins. There are four negotiating sins that negotiators commit. Number one is the lose-lose, leaving value on the table. Again, you're going to hear me say this. You cannot negotiate a good deal unless you know what a good deal looks like. For people that are buying a house, you say, you know what? I got a budget. My budget's 600000 bucks for a house. But if they throw in a car and a tool shed and half their furniture and a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and the bank knocks down a half a percent, I might be able to go 625, okay? That's value, and value is different for everybody. It's what we perceive. You need to know what your value is when you go into the negotiating process. What is the most optimistic, most pessimistic, most likely? Number two is paying more than value, known as the winner's curse. Remember when we had the big housing boom and people were paying $100,000, $150,000, $200,000 more than what the market was worth? Well, they got the house, but they paid a million dollars for the house. But if they try to sell the house tomorrow, it's only worth seven fifty, dollars And it's going to take them three or four years or maybe with even our pandemic going on now, five years to get that back. You'll see this sometimes at auctions where, uh, and, and we all fall victim of this, um, where people bid on a trick and they start the bidding off at $1,000. Well, finally, somebody wins at $4,500 and they get the certificate and they say, the trip is worth $3,200. Well, you've overpaid for that trip by $1,600 or whatever the case may be. Paying more than, what, uh, than, than value. What is the value for what you're asking? Number three is arrogance. Big no-no, walking away from the table. I'm gonna tell you a story. Uh, about three years ago, I was helped mediating a contract with a rubber company in Waterloo. 
and the president of the association said, this is obvious, you don't care about us, you don't want to make a deal, we're out of here. You come back to us when you've got something reasonable to discuss. The negotiator on the other side said, that's fine, we'll get in touch with you. Now I'm the mediator here. I have no ax to grind, I'm getting paid just the same, whether there's a deal or no deal. Three weeks go by, you, the, the association says, when are you calling us back to the table? Oh, the answer was this. Oh yeah, well you told us to call, to give you a call back when we have something reasonable. We don't have anything reasonable right now. As a matter of fact, we're moving some of the manufacturing out of this province to another country. So instead of having 425 jobs, when we come back, there might be 80 to 85 jobs. It's cheaper that way. And the association president says, you can't do that. The company said, yeah, watch us. They did it. Don't do that. Don't walk away because the other party takes it personal because it goes to their ego and it, and, and it makes them feel relatively unimportant. Threats don't work. People do not respond well to threats because they take that personal. And you're going to hear me say, negotiation isn't personal, it's a business. This one is personal. And number four is settling for terms that are worse than what you have. That's called agreement bias. Now, sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes, but it should be rare. Agreement bias might be, everybody, uh, we're going to keep our jobs, we've got job security, but we're going to have to take uh, 50 cents less an hour. Or in, in an agreement that I worked out not that long ago in a mediation where, whereby the company will not pay double time for overtime on weekends. All overtime over 44 hours will be paid a time and a half regardless of when it was. And for that, the other side got job security. They got all full-time people are guaranteed 40 hours of work per week for the length of the contract. Subcontractors or part-time people come and go as they please. That was, a, that was and financially, maybe they got less, but they got, they, they got job security. But agreement bias, when you give away everything uh, and uh, you, the current situation that you have is gonna wind up to be better than what you negotiated, that, that could turn around and be a sin. So I talk about those four sins, something to keep in mind, something that you may want to consider when negotiating a contract because they do happen. So let's talk a little bit about negotiating truisms. What's that all mean? Well, truism number one, you cannot negotiate a good deal unless you know what a good deal looks like. I go in sometimes to negotiation and the one, I say to the one party, so what's your plan? We don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, we're gonna hear what the other party has to offer. I say, you don't wanna do that. You don't wanna do that. Because when you listen to what the other party has to offer, when they give you that offer, they have now set the anchor for negotiations to begin. So when you go in there and they say, well, this is what we're offering bang, you're now negotiating from their side of the table. It's almost like for those of us who play, um, who follow football. Football is a game of field position. It's not a game of getting, on in the getting into the end zone. That's a symptom of good field position. It's the same with negotiation. If I can establish field position by laying down the anchor, I now focus your negotiating strategy over my, uh, uh, in, re in respect to my offer, my offer. That's when people go in and buy a house. So how much you asking? I'm asking 700,000. Ooh, wow, geez, I was hoping to spend 550. Maybe the other party only wants six, but he's asking seven. See, so you want, you want to know what a good deal looks like and don't be afraid to lay down the anchor. Number two, it's never in the best interest to piss the other party off. I use that term uh, and I don't mean it to be uh, uh, counterproductive, but if we really believe in care 
If we really believe in trust and if we really believe in commitment, never ever, it's not wise for you to get the other party all riled up. And one of the things that I talk about and um, uh, on my website, on my website at policymanagement.com, the April article, April of 2020, it talks a little bit about mastering the art of negotiation through negotiating truisms. One of the things that I talk about in point number two, it's never in your best interest to tick the other party off is that people who are foolish, do, or who, are, who, are, who are, people are not foolish and they don't respond positively to threats. It's important to keep the conversation positive and non-confrontational, always searching for common ground, cornerstones to be successful. That's what we're looking at. What can we give you what you need so we can kind of sort of get what we want? Number three, negotiation is an exercise in information exchange. And what I'm talking about here is first, open communication can set a cooperative and also a personal tone and lead to constructive negotiations. And secondly, negotiation shapes the perception of other parties around the issues at hand. And when stakes are high, information exchange is a tactical as well as strategic. Number four, aggressive goals are good. Everybody respects aggressive goals, but aggressive behavior is not good. Not threats. If you do that, if you do this, we're going to do that. It's not a good idea. You know, Zig Ziglar wrote an article or uh, wrote a book. It, it was called Reaching for the Top. And one of the things he said, you always shoot for the moon because even if you miss, you fall amongst the stars. That's good information. People respect people who shoot for the moon, but you need to have a fallback position that doesn't include that aggressive behavior. And the example that I ask, or, or that I bring out, how many times you wanted to sell something, and said, geez, I'd like to get a hundred bucks for it, but you put it up for 125, but you also know $80 you'll take, but that's the worst. So somebody comes back and says, well, I can give you 80. And you say, well, why don't we split the difference to make it a hundred? If your response say 80, I could sell 500 of these for 80. That's not a good idea. Because what the other party's hearing you say is that what they have to say isn't as important. And here's the other thing about aggressive behavior. And people don't come out and tell and, 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 and say this, but what they what they perceive is that aggressive behavior is based on emotional is based on emotions. And people know this is that they'll never argue with an idiot because an idiot will drag them down to their level and beat them with experience. They're not interested in that. They're not interested in the emotional component. In a negotiation piece, don't take it personal. It isn't. It's just business. Get the emotions out of it. Number two, threats. Any type of threat can be counterproductive to the end result because you may wind up with less than what you could have got. And last but not least, it's counterproductive to your credibility. Number five, negotiation. In negotiation, your reputation is everything. I ran a negotiation course uh, not that long ago, I think in January I did one. And what, what I did is I, had, I, I did it for a real estate company and I had 30 people in the group. And what I did is I brought in three people who were my uh, who were my associates. The other parties never met them. And I told them this, and before they came in, I said, this is Susan. Susan is a real tough negotiator. The other party, I said, this is Joe. Joe's a real cooperative kind of guy. And and he, he's willing to listen. And the last person I brought in was a lady by the name of Helen. And I said, I don't know a whole lot about Helen. I haven't worked with her that much. So really it's unknown. I allowed them to negotiate for an hour. They all negotiated the same way. They were plants. 
but the other 30 people didn't know. We broke it up into teams of 10. One team had the tough negotiator, one had the cooperative one, one had the unknown. The one who was the tough one got no deal. The other, the other side didn't trust them because they always thought there was, some, there was something else or a hidden agenda. The one who was unknown, A, got the best deal and got it quicker, and the cooperative one got a deal, and it took the full one hour. And at the end, we just told them they're just ordinary people. They know nothing about negotiation. As a matter of fact, I work with them. And the reputation that you had planted actually influenced the, uh, that I had planted actually influenced the negotiating process. So your reputation is everything because that's what the other party believes going in. Number six uh, is no, uh, learn to love your BATNA. BATNA is an, a, is an acronym for the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And uh, when I talk about your best alternative to a negotiated agreement, what I'm saying is that you want to be able to know what is the worst solution that you're willing to accept. What is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement? Because if you don't know, you'll accept anything. In other words, when do I say, you know what, I can't make this happen. I need a little bit more. And this is what I need. And don't be afraid to ask for it. It's fair. You're in a negotiation. But most people, as a matter of fact, in my, in my career, 50% of all people who negotiate don't have a best alternative to a negotiated agreement. They're just going in there and will react accordingly. I'm sitting there saying, how, how do you do that? How do you do that? Do you do that when you buy a car? You got to know what you can afford. You got to know what you're looking for. You got to know what kind of features you want. You have a best alternative to negotiate a group when you buy a house. All those things matter. You do it in your personal life, do it in your professional life. Number seven, know when to say no. Know what your walk away position is. Uh, sometimes you're not being arrogant here. But sometimes you got to say, no, I can't, I can't do that. I can't pay you that sum of money. I don't have it. And I'm going to be in business and not return to the shareholder and not shareholder wealth. I can't do it. I'm not able to function that way. You have to know when to hold them. Like Kenny Rogers would say, know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. Sometimes you got to, and I'm not just saying you get up and leave. That's arrogance. It's a, Obviously, we can't make a deal. The sticking points are one, two, and three. And there's got to be something better. Why don't we reassess this, come back a week from now or three days from now, whatever the case may be, because we're going down this path and I, I can't sell for anything like that. So know when to walk away. Number eight, sometimes the best deals are the ones that aren't made. I'm going to give you an example of this. Um, anybody here who follows football can relate to this, okay? In 1961, I'm going to go back to 61. I was just a kid then. Um, the Buffalo Bills were an AFL team. They weren't an NFL team. They were an AFL team. They were a part of the American Football League Conference. And the Hamilton Tiger Cats were, were a CFL team. And they were a very good one. They had won several great cups uh, for in the 50s and, and uh, well into the 60s. Well, the Tiger Cats were in the middle of their season in August. I believe it goes back to about August the 10th or so. And the Buffalo Bills are in the middle of their training camp. Well, the Bills came over to play the Hamilton Tiger Cats in Hamilton at the old Civic Stadium. And the Cats whipped them. Uh, I think the score was 38 to 21. Well, after the game, Ralph Wilson, the owner of the Buffalo Bills, approached Mr. Bill Southern and said to him, I'd like to buy your team. I will give you the Buffalo Bills and 25,000 U.S. dollars, which was the equivalent to 20,000 Canadian at that time. That's where Canadian money was worth a little bit more in exchange for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. 
And Mr. Bill Southern said, you know, I appreciate your offer, Mr. Wilson, but the cats are not for sale. I, I won't do that deal. And as Mr. Wilson walked away very uh, disenchanted that he couldn't make the deal, Mr. Bill Southern turned around and said to a couple of the associates, says, he's got to be kidding me. Well, how did that work out for Mr. Wilson? Uh, back in, I believe in 2004, 2005, the Buffalo Bills sold for $1.85 billion US to Terry and Kim Pagula. I don't think, I don't, and I could be wrong on this, but I don't think you're gonna get $1.85 billion for the Hamilton Tiger Cats, US. I don't think you will. Sometimes the best deals are the ones that aren't made because you have to know when you can't make the deal. And it's not, all, it's not always doom and gloom. Number nine is negotiation is not a debate. Nobody wants to hear you pontificate the value and the benefits of your position. Because to tell you the honest truth, they don't care. All parties think their position is unique. All parties think their position is of value. Can I trust you? Are you committed? Do you care about me? That's what it comes down to. I can do this, but I need this. I'll give you what you want, but you've got to give me what I need. It's an exchange of information, walking people through a process. And last but not least, never take it personal. It isn't, it's just business. You can't take the negotiation personal because people who take it personal have a tendency to create enemies because it's a sense of unreasonableness or it sometimes is, I got robbed on that deal and I'm gonna get even. It isn't personal. It's, it, it's just basically business. Some things that can irritate people during a, um, during a negotiation, when people start saying, be reasonable, when you start telling people to be reasonable, they take that as a slap in the face because they don't think they are reasonable. They may think they're being extremely reasonable from their point of view. Remember, our job is to shape the perception of the other party. Stay away from phrases like, are you kidding me? Yes, but. Can I be candid with you? When a person says, can I be candid with you? That tells you they're not always candid. Or you have to understand. I understand totally your position. You don't have to tell me again. I get it. I got it the first time. Let's move on. To be perfectly clear, I am perfectly clear. The one that I like is hypothetically speaking. Negotiators don't deal on hypothetics. They deal in facts. They deal in truisms. They deal with the here and now. And they don't invent numbers. This isn't the Donald Trump style of negotiation where you invent stuff and hope something sticks to the wall. The facts have to be provable. The numbers have to be right. Because somebody's going to say, where'd you get those numbers? Because I don't have those numbers. Or coming up to be totally honest with you. What that tells me is that you're not always honest with me. If you're going to tell me to be totally honest with me, it means you're not honest with me. So now what I'm doing as the guy on the other side, I'm looking for the skeletons in the closet. Because now you're telling me you're not being factual, you're not being true. And last but not least is the one that, and I don't know where this came from, but it comes out all the time. Really? Really? Really, really? Yeah, really. Yeah, really. The bottom line is nobody wants to know about really. Somebody gives you a fact, discuss the fact, tell them how the fact fits, how it doesn't fit, how you can massage that fact to turn it to a win-win situation. Discussion tactics. We talk about irritants, let's talk about discussion facts, dis discussion tactics. These are the things that I think work well. These are the six things that I've always found to be successful for me. Number one, make one point at a time. Okay, you don't wanna be running all over the place. Make one point at a time. One person talks at a time. Usually you have a point person that does most of the speaking for you, but make one point at a time, ensure that the other party understands that. Use one question at a time. Stay away from multiple questions, stay away from leading questions. 
The questions start with when, why, why, when, where, why, how, who, the open focus questions, get an answer, tie it down, bank it. Don't apologize for what you want. I'm sorry to inform you, but we want to work 20 hours a day and get 40. Really? And get 40 hours of pay. How's that work? Why? Who else is doing that? Uh, how do we make money? How does this work for us? All those things are important. You should be able to back that up and not apologize. Don't say I was hoping. Hope is not a strategy in negotiation. Never has been, never will be. In other words, stay away from hope. Know what the best alternative to a negotiated agreement is. That's what we're looking for. Stay away from the hypothetical questions. We talked about that. And always be able to qualify your movement. So it could be as simple as me saying, you know what, Rob? I'm glad we agree on that. Because you were able to reduce the hours of work from 40 to 35 per week, but give us the same salary, we could see our way clear of any time we work below 44 hours, that's paid at regular time, and any time over 44 hours is paid at time and a half to a maximum of 70 hours a week. After 70 hours a week, nobody can work. Always be able to qualify your movement. Just don't say, yeah, okay, fine, take it. Because the other party's now saying to themselves, wow, that was easy. Maybe it didn't mean that much. They see that as being an insult. Even though it might not have been intended to be that way, the it's not always what you say. It's how I, how I interpret what you say. So always be able to qualify your movement. And I think that's about it from my standpoint. Rob, that's not bad. We finished in about uh, 40 minutes. And, uh, nice job. Nice job, Nick. There's what a, I'd like to do is leave it open for questions, answers, comments, concerns, any burning issues that people have. You got ab minutes. Absolutely. No, and I'm glad you did budget some time because it's a, it's a very nuanced topic, right? Negotiating and uh, in so many different situations that can be applied to. And I do see there's a, a couple questions that have filtered in and uh, sure. actually the, the, the first one is actually one of the most common things we see at the Enterprise Center. Um, it's about leases and uh, somebody is asking, you know, what would you recommend when negotiating a new lease agreement? So I, I, I think there it's coming from the angle of, hey, I'm, I'm looking for a location when I'm talking with a landlord. Well, how would you, how would you what would you recommend when I'm negotiating with that landlord for a new lease? The first thing I look at, what can I afford? Number one, what can I afford? Uh, so my example might be, I can afford $1,000 a month lease. I can go 1200 if it's in this location. Okay. I can afford a thousand, but I'd like to pay eight. I'd like to pay 800. So what do I need to do that? The landlord may turn around and say, well, you know, uh, Joe uh, or Helen or whatever the case may be, I could do 900 a month if you give me a 48 month lease. Hmm. Okay. So you, you want to know what is your optimal position and what are you willing to pay for that optimal position versus what's the least, what's the max. You want to have a range. Now, let's say there's no landlord in the Niagara region that's going to give you what you want for less than 1200 bucks a month. Now you need to go back to the drawing board and you need to say, are my needs too high or am what I'm willing to put out in terms of cash too low? And how do I balance those two things out? So maybe from a landlord perspective, it's all about security and cash flow. So he or she wants X amount of dollars per month and they want a lease that's this long. Well, that may be it. So what can you do? Those negotiations are within your control because you could go back and sharpen your pencil, dull your pencil, find out what's happening. And sometimes you might not be able to make that work. So you stay with what you got and you live with it for the next couple of months or the next year or so. But it's always negotiable. Remember the landlords are in the same position you are. 
they want to get the building rented. They want to secure, they want to secure a lease. Now, if I'm a landlord and I could get a 48 month lease, I would say, okay, uh, Rob, uh, your company could have it, but you got to pay me the first three months and the last three months up front. So I got to have six months. And for that, I'll reduce the other 36 months by X amount of dollars. So it becomes an exercise in information exchange and what I can give you what you want so I can get what I need. Remember, the landlord wants cash flow. Right. The landlord wants certainty. And remember, certainty is one of the six basic needs. First need, uh, first human need is certainty. The second one is variety. The third one is significance. The fourth one is connection. The fifth one is grow, uh, growth. And the sixth one is contribution. But the one that tops them all is certainty. Right. I want certainty because certainty breeds survival and survival buys me time. Perfect. So look at it from his or her perspective too. It's all negotiable. It's all yes, negotiable. Absolutely. It's and, and leases in particular, I think a lot of pe a lot of our small businesses, the first time they're uh, looking for a lease, they think it's uh, like renting an apartment where it's governed by uh, by the provincial government, uh, but not so with commercial leases. Everything's no. negotiable. Yeah, and even, great that, even if that is negotiated by the provincial government for residential leases, but it starts from the time you enter into the lease. Right. So that's the key that's negotiable. Once you go into a lease of $2,000 a month, they can only raise that by what the provincial standard says, but everything's governed from that initial part. Right. Uh, there's a, a couple more questions here. Yeah, far away. Um, what do you do? So sometimes there's an imbalance of power between the parties who negotiate. Right. How, what would you recommend for a new business which is not known and has so much less power comparing to the other party? Uh, first thing I would do when I mean, there's an imbalance of power, I would ask the other party as to what their expectations are. And the other party, if they're professional, they'll say, I'd be more than willing to tell you what my expectations are if you're willing to share what your expectations are. So why don't you list on a sheet of paper your expectations, I'll list on a piece of paper my expectations, and we'll exchange them and we'll study them. So the imbalance of power is going to happen all the time. And th that can happen right now in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, employment opportunities. I had a number of employers saying, there's not enough people to fill jobs. People want to start at $30 an hour and work up. I'm not paying 30 bucks an hour. I'm paying 14, I'm paying 15. There's an imbalance of power because the supply is low, the demand is high, as a result, the dollars are gonna to teeter to supply and demand. So one of the things that I do in terms of imbalance of power, I try to take that out of the equation immediately by sharing expectations. What are your expectations of me and this agreement? And what are my expectations of you? Let's start working towards that. And you will find that the person who has a significant amount of power again, is willing to let some of that go if you're providing stability, certainty, some significance, those things. Now, you want, you, you, you want to flatten. You want to flatten that ring a bit. Okay. So definitely some, in, before, before you're negotiating, some information, at the start, some information gathering and understanding, yeah, where the, what their expectations are. It's great advice. And Mm -hmm. um, I guess to some degree also knowing, yeah, knowing what your own expectations are, right? Oh, oh yeah. You have to know what your expectations are and you, it, it, you know, you, you also have to know what you can afford. Uh, you, you'll hear people uh, getting into uh, lease agreements that now uh, they can't afford. They, they, they can't afford it. Forget the pandemic. Mm -hmm. the business has gone down or whatever the case may be. They can't live with the lease and uh, they got to go back and negotiate. Landlord right. saying, "Well, you know, I, I can't renegotiate. If you don't uh, live with your part of the lease, I'm going to sue you." Yes, That's because they didn't 
they didn't do a good job in anticipating the factors associated with that. Okay. Perfect. So now the balance of power now has slipped over to the uh, to the leaser, not the leasee. Gotcha. Um, next question is uh, relating to somebody providing HR services. Uh, right. Uh, I'm a new business providing HR services. I'm starting to approach new business clients. Mm -hmm. uh, wh what would you recommend for me to secure a new client and have a win-win for both of us? Number one thing is if I'm going in to see that client, number one thing I want, I want to be able to do is determine what, what the, what the win-win uh, points are for that client. What specifically do they need and what they're looking for? Um, uh, that's number one. And number two, what I'm going to do is I'm going to capitalize on what those needs are with my strengths. The example that I might use, I go in to see clients to provide certain services, but they're saying, oh no, we want, uh, we want a consultant in here that'll teach our people how to present properly, how to use PowerPoint, how to set up a PowerPoint presentation. Well, that's not what I do. I don't do that. So I'm not taking on an assignment that I'm not qualified for. So mm -hmm. what I want to do is I want to be able, if I'm, the, if I'm that HR specialist, I want to know what my strong points are and how do what I have to offer that client, how does that address what their needs are? So you're going to have to do some homework about the industry that the client is in, number one. And number two, do a little bit of homework about that client as, as per se. And that's where sometimes small talk uh, is great. One of the things that I've always done, especially in behavioral interviewing, is when a client comes in to talk to me, I don't talk about the job for the first five or 10 minutes. I talk about life in general. I talk about the, uh, I talk about maybe politics. I talk about COVID-19. I talk about what they might be interested in because now I get an opportunity to determine what is near and dear to them. And I can also calibrate their pitch of voice in order to determine when they're telling me a truth, a half truth or no truth at all, because people can count people calibrate their voice differently. So when I go in and see that client or when I'm talking to that HR, that, that company who's going to hire an HR person, I'm trying to figure out very, very quickly, A, what's important to them, and B, how I can fill that. And last but not least, don't promise something that you can't deliver. If you can't deliver it, say, I, I can't deliver. I, I, I'm not, that's not my skill set. And uh, I'd be happy to help that person down the road if they want any more information. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I, I had one I, I wanted to ask you is, because uh, um, I don't see any others right the second, but one I wanted to ask you is, uh, what strategies do you recommend? Like, let's say you're, you're working on a pretty big negotiation that's gonna be a significant amount of money for you and uh, significant length of time maybe. So it's a big commitment. Uh, what if you're unsure? How do you, how do you buy yourself time? Like, let's say you're midway through a negotiation and somebody gives you an offer and, and it's, I don't know, I don't want to say life changing, but it's a big deal. Uh, what, what do you do when you, when you're presented that offer and they're asking you, do you, do you like it? Do you not like it? Um, any tactics there that are, you know, genuine that can help you out? <laughs> Boy, we should all be in such a good position. <laughs> right. Well, well, uh, a couple of so, things. That, like what I'm thinking is like, let's say I'm going to commit to a five-year lease with a landlord and it's yeah. uh, 2000 a month for five years. That's close. Right. You know, it's around a hundred thousand dollars I'm committing right. to. Right. So what, what do I do when the landlord presents me that lease agreement? Uh, just as an example, uh, uh, is what I'm thinking. Like, what, what do oh, I what do I do to to buy myself some time to make sure I'm getting the right the right deal? Well, the first thing I would say to the landlord and something like that. Let's say you're the landlord and you're going to lease me a piece of property. First yeah. thing I'd say to you is, um, thank you very much, Rob. I I certainly do appreciate the fact that uh, you'd want me here for uh, 60 months, and um, I'm not saying that's not doable. Um, I'm just uh, I wasn't prepared to address that. I was thinking of something more like 24 months. However, I'm not saying 60 months is out of the equation. I'd be willing to do that, but there's some things that I need to consider along the way. 
can I get a little bit of time? Can I get the next 48 hours to get my head around that offer? Because I wasn't prepared. And if the landlord comes back and says, yeah, you can, Rob, uh, you know, you, you, uh, or yeah, you can, Nick, uh, but I need you to know that I've got somebody else who's willing to commit to 60 months. The next question out of my mouth is, is it at the same price? Is it at 2000 bucks a month? It's right. relatively close. Well, relatively close can mean 1400 bucks a month. So that's relatively close, depending on what you determine what closeness is. So uh, the first thing I do is I say, okay, is, uh, well, let me go back and tweak that. Now, do I want to be in your building for 60 months? If the answer is no, I don't want to be there, then I don't have to go any further because maybe I want to build my own building in three years. Right. So I don't want to commit to 60 months. I don't care if it's 1200 bucks a month. That's the first thing I got to, so I, I want to buy myself time by A, thanking the person for that and B, clearly stating to the person, I wasn't expecting that, but I'm overjoyed by the fact that you offered that. So I need a little bit of time. So let's say you can live with 60 months. So you know what? That's not a bad deal. It's right downtown St. Catharines. It's where all the action is. It's, it does everything. Now what can I afford? Well, at that rate, I can afford 1800. Okay, well, 1800. But what happens if A, B, or C happens? Now you want to put an escape clause in there or the opportunity to renegotiate after a certain period of time. Yeah, you see that a lot in negotiations, whereby um, even on contract negotiations, where you, you sign a person and you say, you know, oh, this is a four-year plan, this is a four-year deal, but I reserve the right after 12 months or after 16 months to renegotiate as things change. So, yeah, the contract goes that long but there's a clause in there that allows me the opportunity to renegotiate if something changes in my business. Gotcha. Yeah. You want that. You want, you want a fallback position. You want a parachute because 60 months is a long time. It's a long time. There's a lot that can happen in that period of time. And, and you know, who would have predicted that we would have been in the position that we're in in right. February, you know, there's people that lost five or six months work in one day. Nobody would have predicted that. But again, if you've got a fallback position, it makes life just a little bit easier, in my opinion. Thank you, Nick. I, I'm just, uh, I'll just tell everybody we have time for one more question, if there, sure. if there are any. Uh, uh, this has been really helpful. I'd just like to bring you to my next negotiation. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, really. yeah. But no, a lot of really good practical tips here um, with it, and and I really like how you stress understanding what the other party needs and understanding what you need yourself. I think uh, right. I think that's really important. So it looks like there is one. Oh, just a, a thank you from one of the people who asked a question. So uh, saying thanks, great session. So well, thank you. Yes, yes. So thank looks you. like your answer landed. So. Oh. Good, good, good. Yeah. Any other questions, comments, concerns, burning issues, anything? I'll um, I'll put a link to um. I, I'll put a link to your website. I put a link to yeah. the article. I put a link to the article earlier. I'll just put okay. a second link to the uh, sure. the website itself. Sure. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah anybody who wants to get in touch with me, you're staying in touch. Um, uh, my email is neckofpolicymanagement.com. You can reach me on Facebook, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. It's uh, policy management and management is MGMT. Uh, you can reach me on my website at www.policymanagement.com where you can call me. Okay. It's there. Uh, I'll be more than, more than happy to address any of your questions, comments, or concerns, issues that you might have. Uh, more than happy.